I covered the Chauvin case, Derek Chauvin. Uh, oh, really? George Floyd, yeah. And um, That was a controversial one. Oh, my God. Yeah, I covered it um, on air, uh, did it for 18 days, always on air. I think it was like four hours a day for 18 days. Interesting. What did you come up with on that one? It was horrible. I, I, I hated covering it, and this is just my personal perspective because the network that I was covering it with at the time – they would bring in essentially attorneys that wanted to fight. I'm kind of the one constant right here on the science yeah. guy, you know, kind of talking about um, talking about what trying to explain what they're talking about on the stand from a scientific standpoint and trying to remain as neutral as I possibly be yeah. can be because so many people had an opinion about that case, you know, right. one way or another. It was ideological. Yeah, it was ideological. And that's a weird place to be in mm -hmm. from a forensic standpoint, you know. And so I tried to walk that line to be very, very careful and purposed in what I was saying so that, you know, if you want to go back and look at it scientifically and understand that, you know, with – with Floyd's death, it was a perfect storm, I think. Um, you know, you think about the drugs that he had on board, uh, and then you think about the actions that were taken with him, um, and it it wound up bringing about his death, regardless of how you, you know, you might personally feel about it from a political standpoint or whatever mm -hmm. your worldview is. Um, and But the most important thing was, are the scientists that are on the stand how is this going to impact the jury or the judge in making a decision? Is what they're saying actually, is it feasible? Okay, because, you know, both sides have their own, um, have their own, um, their own group of scientists that they're going to call upon. Uh, the defense was at a real disadvantage, I think, because um, they had very, very little resources to call on relative to medical experts that could address this. It's the only case that I've ever seen, I think, when it comes to the prosecution, when it came to the medical examiner, that one medical examiner did the autopsy, and then the same prosecution offered up, I think it was a total of two other, uh, two other opinions by forensic pathologists, one of which used to work at the same office, that differed from what the actual pro sector of record said mm -hmm. um that was a real weird kind of thing to observe there you know just trying to take it all in and understand that you know what would what would possess the prosecutor to want to bring in i think a total of three forensic pathologists and then they've got uh, uh a, a guy that deals with uh cardiorespiratory stuff, you know, this, uh, I think it was an Irishman, you know, that had appeared. He was for the prosecution. They, they threw a lot, you know, in that case for the, for the jury to take a look at and understand. Um, and it was really hard kind of cutting through, you know, a lot of the minutia that was mm. out there. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing that like uh, what the phenomena that happens over time with things like this is like, like you remember it when it happens. Like I remember watching the video, mm. right? And then afterwards, after that happens, then you have everyone's opinion online. Yep. And then you have time goes by and time goes by and people's, when you start reading these opinions, everyone layering their opinion and, and this happened now, what was it five years ago? Something like that? Yeah. Six years ago, whatever yeah, it was. Yeah. And now it's like you're so far removed from it mm -hmm. and you want to remember something that happened. It's like, well, I remember watching the video for 10 minutes five years ago. And I also have like hours and hours and hours of reading people talking about it and people's opinions of it yep. that are have nothing to do with what actually happened. Right. You yeah, know, just trying to understand the facts. The as narrative it yeah. evolves. Yes, it, it does. It becomes so disconnected from the reality of what actually happened. And when I saw it, yeah. I saw a dude with his knee on the guy. I don't know if I remember it was on his neck. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. But the cop had his knee on the guy's neck forever. And he was like saying, uh, you know, like, let me go, let me go. I can't breathe, can't breathe, whatever. And then eventually the guy stopped moving, right? Yeah. Yeah. He, he arrested uh, there at that moment. And, uh, and was he dead on the ground? Did he die right there next to the car, next to the car on the ground, or did they he rolled die later? him? They rolled him into the emergency room, and uh, if I remember correctly, I think he still had like agonal respirations. You know, it's like 
you know, kind of like this. And mm-hmm. they called it, you know, um, they called it there in the ER. But I think for all intents and purposes, he was probably gone at that moment in time mm-hmm. there in that, you know, that gutter, you know, uh, adjacent right. to the sidewalk. Right. Right next to the tire yeah. of the car. Yeah. Right there. And, um, you know, there, and you never know about restraint deaths because, they 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 happen they used to happen a lot more frequently i I don't uh you would get you know we kind of evolved um and i'm saying this from the medical legal perspective i'm not saying this from a police practitioner perspective i'm talking about what what we observe because Mm -hmm. we have to handle these cases in our field and be as objective as we possibly can you know form and function what was what was what were the mechanics involved in all of right. this how did it actually go down and then that's what i'm talking about trying mm. to remain neutral in right. this world and present the, the findings as to what the mechanism of death actually was well right. were there any other contributing factors right you know so drugs what, that sort of thing well there's two camps there's the it's binary with george floyd it's either it's either the camp where he he only died because he was high on drugs on fentanyl mm-hmm. and there's a there's another camp that says no the cop basically strangled him to death and he he died because of the cop was had his mm-hmm. knee on his on his neck. Yes. Yeah. Um but there's also like some people are saying maybe it was a combination of the I both. Think that it, yeah, I think that it probably was. You know, here's the question uh, and you can't get past this. Uh if he were if if Floyd had those substances on board, would he otherwise have died while he was walking down the street? Right. Were they at lethal sure. levels at that point in time? And I think if remembering back. Was it just a perfect coincidence that that was the one time he was about to overdose was when the cop put his knee on his neck? Yeah. And you, and then, you know, because here's the thing, if, uh, if you've got these drugs on board, they're going to compromise your ability to uptake oxygen anyway. And mm-hmm. so you get this individual right. in this asymmetrical position where they're, you know, they're flat on the ground. You've got, mm-hmm. um, you know, just the chest being able to rise and fall is going to compromise mm-hmm. their ability to process oxygen. You've already got uh, a system that's being affected by substance that's, that's, you know, bounding through your system already. Right. It is, it's a perfect storm. And, you know, it was, uh, very unfortunate that it happened. Um, I, I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, and it's not really my place to know whether or not they got it right or not. I, I know that had had that those two individuals not met at that point in time, it'd probably be a different story. Mm, totally. <laughs>